Matthew chapter 5, verses 20 through 24. And the King James text today reads as follows. For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Ye have heard that it was said of them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath ought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. I'm going to talk to us for a while today on the topic, Doing Right by Those We've Wronged. If you'll bow your heads with me one more moment. King Jesus, once again, Lord, we thank you, God, for your presence in this place. Lord, I thank you for being the dearest friend that I've ever had. Master, in the name of Jesus, loose the anointing of the Holy Ghost in the house of God today. Let the power of the Almighty touch your servant. Help me to deliver this important word of instruction to the people of God. Lord, today so few are preaching godly instruction and instruction in righteousness. And yet, this is the message you've given me for God's people at this moment in time. But I recognize I have no talent, no gift, no ability in myself. If I'm to be effective in communicating to your people what you would have me to communicate, I need the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Touch my lips, touch as well the ear of every hearer. For we ask it in the precious saving name, Jesus. Amen. Praise God and amen. We live in an hour and in a time, as I said, as I pray, when God's people are not being instructed in the ways of righteousness. We have preachers today filling pulpits and preachers today filling the airwaves with messages and instruction that completely, entirely annihilate and contradict the truth of God's Word. We have preachers today that preach messages which are in complete and utter contradiction with the Word of God, encouraging God's people to be angry, encouraging God's people to be malicious, encouraging God's people to be hateful. Well, I'm here to tell you today, the Word of God tells us as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. And I'm here to tell you today, it's just like it was in Noah's day. There was nobody preaching righteousness. There was nobody preaching how to live right and how to do right. As God's people, the Bible said Noah was a preacher of righteousness. Well, I'm here to tell you, Jesus is coming. And God's people need to get right. They need to live right. They need to walk right and talk right so they can be ready when Jesus comes. My job is to preach righteousness. It is to preach 
the right way for God's people to conduct themselves. We've got politicians on the scene these days who are running for office. I'm going to be a little specific today. we got one fella down in Georgia running for senator. And he has a track record of a lifestyle that is full of all kinds of debauchery. Mm -hmm. He's got children from several women, none of whom he was married to. He's accused of paying for abortions for girlfriends because he didn't want them having kids that he then would be responsible for. So for a man who today touts that he's anti-abortion, he sure didn't seem to be anti-abortion back then. Oh, but we're told by him that he's redeemed. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And because he's redeemed, everyone is supposed to overlook the transgressions of his past. The women he's wronged, the children he's had nothing to do with, the people he's done dirty, all of them need to get over it. Because after all, now he stands among the redeemed. Well, I've got news for you today, my friend. That is in complete contradiction to the teaching of God's Word. And any preacher that tells you that people need to just get over the wrong you've done them because you now stand redeemed is a liar and a false prophet and does not represent God or His Word. The truth of the matter is, the Word of God instructs us. It tells us how we are to conduct ourselves when it comes to those whom we have wronged. My Lord, have mercy. As the people of God, we have a responsibility to those whom we have in the past offended, wounded, or injured. Redemption and forgiveness from God are not a free pass to move on and simply ignore the transgressions of our past. This spiritual transaction, we call it salvation, does not then nullify or, or erase our responsibilities in this natural world. Now we've got this political figure in our nation today. And the GOP has attached their hopes to him so they can regain power and control in the Senate. And he's running around responding to accusations of past indiscretions and offenses by simply saying, you're looking at a redeemed man. While that man may be redeemed in God's eyes, God's forgiveness does not erase or eradicate his earthly obligations and responsibilities related to those same past transgressions. My Lord, have mercy. Hmm. It is the responsibility of the church to teach God's people right from wrong. While many preachers today are focused on cultural wars and political debates, they fail to declare plainly the whole counsel of God for the church of the living God. So without full and proper instruction, many in the church are behaving in ways that completely contradict godly living and in so doing they bring great shame upon the faith mm -hmm. the word of God said in the last days the way of truth would be evil spoken of this is why because people claiming to be Christians are not living like Christians 
were they doing so, then there would be no accusation except false accusation that people could bring against the church. The problem is the accusations being made today are not false accusations. You have people, men like this man, who claim to be born again, who claims his sins have been forgiven, and yet he still has children out there by various women from his past that he takes no responsibility for, that he makes no effort to take part in their lives. Well, listen, if you're redeemed, if you're a born-again child of God, i got news for you. You ought to be doing those things. That's you right. should be going to those women and saying, hey, I've been born again. The right thing for me to do from here on out is to take care of these kids and to make sure they know I'm their daddy and to make sure they know that I'm there for them and I'm part of their lives and I'll always be there for them. Not to continue ignoring them. Not to continue acting like they don't exist. My Lord, have mercy. In Acts chapter 26, verses 16 through 20, the Word of God said, But rise and stand upon thy feet. This is the Apostle Paul's conversion experience. For I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a witness, excuse me, a minister, and to witness both of these things which Thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, this is Paul sharing his conversion experience of what the Lord said to him at the time of his conversion experience before Agrippa. He said, Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, but showed first unto them of Damascus, and at Jerusalem, and throughout all the coasts of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, listen, that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. In our primary text, Matthew chapter 5, the word of the Lord told us, Jesus speaking, and the word of God told us, if you come to the altar and you've got a gift that you mean to give to God, and yet you remember before you bring your gift, you remember that there's somebody that you've offended. You remember there's somebody you've hurt. You remember there's somebody that you've done wrong. Jesus said, leave your gift and go and make that matter right. Then come back and bring your gift. In this text, the Apostle Paul said, the minute that the Lord called me to preach and the minute I had my encounter with Jesus, he said my message became repentance and doing works, doing actions that exemplified or that help to illustrate that you were truly repentant. That's what works meet for repentance means, okay? Demonstrate that your repentance is real by reason of your actions and your conduct. Now, I preached just a little while ago about faith and how our faith is demonstrated through our actions. Got news for you there, Mr. Politician in Georgia who wants to run around behind the declaration, I'm a redeemed man. Why don't you start acting redeemed? Bring forth works, meet under a penance. Demonstrate that your salvation and your experience with God are real because you still have an obligation to those that you've wronged. Just because you make something right with God doesn't mean you've made it right with those people. Mm -hmm. Oh my Lord, have mercy. 
Well, I'll tell you something, child molester. Just because you come to Jesus and you pray through and you get your act together and God willing you overcome that terrible pattern of behavior that you've been walking in. That doesn't mean all the children that you've hurt and molested are all of a sudden supposed to just drop their hurt and drop the uh, long-term effects of what you brought upon them through your conduct. You need, you need to go and you need to start apologizing to some people. You need to go you need to start repenting to some people. You know, I've tried to teach in this church on the truth about forgiveness. Many people are of the opinion that you can forgive people their offenses towards you and, and they don't have to know anything about it. You, know, you can just sit in your living room and decide you're going to forgive people. But I'm telling you folks, if you understand forgiveness as it is taught in the Word of God, you understand that forgiveness is contractual. What does that mean? That means it requires two party. You have to have the one who is forgiving and the one who is forgiven. And the two of them together have to come to terms. And once those two have spoken and addressed the matter, if the one who has been wounded says, I forgive you, it is forgiven, then according to the Word of God, that matter is settled, listen, on earth as it is in heaven. It is settled both on earth and in heaven. Meaning, when you stand before God in the judgment, you will not have to answer to Him for that transgression. Why? Because you made it right here. You settled the matter here. But if you live your life doing people dirty and you never make any effort to make it right with the people, I don't care if it's prior to your being born again or after you've been born again. If you make no effort to go and to make right that transgression in this life, God may forgive you to the extent you'll still make heaven your home, but I got news for you. In the judgment, you will still have to answer for that transgression. There are going to be a lot of people on judgment day standing before God, and they're going to be humiliated and embarrassed out of their minds. Because, not that they're going to miss heaven, but there's going to be a trail a mile long of debris behind them that the Lord is going to say now before I can let you in honey we got to settle all this you see all these people you've wounded all these people you hurt all these people you've done dirty they deserve divine justice mm -hmm. and it is not justice if I forgive your debt and then I turn around and I let you skate through scot-free and you don't even get a scold and you don't even get balled out as the old saying goes for it. You hear what I'm telling you now? Now balling out is a whole lot better than going to hell over it. But it's still going to be a humiliation and an embarrassment on judgment day to stand before God and have to get balled out for a line of things that we could have settled here. This is why Jesus said, Whatsoever ye bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Folks, if you study the Word of God, you will find out the Lord is talking about this very issue. Forgiveness, it is contractual. When you have a contract that is uh, uh, legal and legitimate, it is considered and it is called a binding contract. What the Lord is saying is, 
when you come to terms on earth concerning a matter and you determine that that matter is forgiven and there is therefore now no further debt to be paid relative to that matter, he said, guess what? In heaven, it's a binding contract. It's binding in heaven just like it's binding on earth. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Now there are those people who want all my life growing up in the Pentecostal church, I heard them preach about how, oh, God throws our sins in the sea of forgetfulness. Hallelujah. He never again goes fishing for those sins. Got news for you. That is completely out of context. That passage is being completely blown out of context. If you look at the parable, the story that Jesus told of the king who forgave his servant's debt, and then his servant immediately went out, got hold of another one of the servants, and began to throttle him because he owed him money, much less than he had owed the king. You remember the story? What happened? The king got word of it, and he was dragged back before the king. And the king then held him responsible for the debt that he had forgiven already. Oh, what does that tell you? Tell you what it tells me. Tells me that forgiveness can be withdrawn. That's right. That's what it tells me. Why do you think the Word of God says? Why do you think Jesus said, if you don't forgive others, your Father won't forgive you? Well, wait a minute, Lord. No, you said He forgives everything and throws everything into the sea of forgetfulness. No, no, no. That is a passage that is completely taken out of context. That was the writer saying uh, in worship, he was saying how that he was grateful that God, and I'm sure he was thinking of a specific circumstance or of specific things, you know. And he said, you've thrown these sins into the sea of forgetfulness. You know, never again to be remembered. But he was not saying this is what God does with everything he forgives. No, that is not biblical. That is not accurate. That is not true. Because if we don't forgive, the Bible said, and Jesus said, we will not be forgiven. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. Well, then somewhere along the line, there has to be the possibility of forgiveness being withdrawn. Well, we see in the Lord's example in this story that the king withdrew his forgiveness and then he held the man accountable about telling the truth. So you say, well, pastor, why are you sharing this? I'm sharing this because in the truth of forgiveness, there is an important lesson to be learned about settling your issues and settling your matters here. If you've done something in this life that you really ought to seek someone's forgiveness for, you should go to them. Jesus said, don't bring your gift to the altar. Remember that you've done somebody wrong. Remember that somebody's holding something against you. And just bring your gift to the altar as though you're sanctified and you're pure and you're in a good place because you're not. The fact that you even remember this means you now have an obligation to make it right. I found a person on Facebook some years back when we were kids. Kids, I mean kids. I might have been 12 at the time. I did and said some things that when I saw her name on Facebook immediately, my, my, I remembered this particular thing, you know, and I thought to myself, you know, that could have really hurt her. That could have really, I mean, not just hurt her feelings, but I mean, 
could have really done something that would be lasting negative in her life. And I said, I need to apologize to her. I need to make that matter right. So I wrote her a message through Facebook and I said, listen, I wanted to tell you, I remember this, this thing and I am so sorry for it and I apologize and uh, honey, please, if you can find it in your heart to forgive me, I'd appreciate it because I, I had, you know, no intention to hurt you and I never would want to hurt you. And, I, and if I can make it right in some way, I want to make it right. Well, let me tell you, she came back to me with a very negative, very nasty kind of a response. She wasn't very happy with me. Apparently, what I had said and done did hurt her. And it did have lasting impact on her. And she didn't come back all, you know, merciful and willing to forgive and all that. And at first, it, it kind of stung me when, when I read her response. And, and I kind of almost, my ire kind of went up a little bit. I was like, well, you know, I tried to make it right. I tried. And then, Tommy, after a minute, I thought about it. I said, now, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know what? That girl has the right to feel the way she's feeling. Now, I've done my part, and God knows I've done my part. She's, not, she's a Christian girl, so she's not doing her part at this point. But I've done mine. Do you follow what I'm trying to tell you today? But I knew that I had an obligation to her. There have been people that I dated years ago. And I may, I, when I was out of church for that matter, and I might have said something or I might have done something that was hurtful and unnecessary and, you know, painful for them. And I've gone back, I've told Tommy, I said, you know, I happened upon this person that I, on Facebook, and we had dated years back, and I don't know why I did this, but I did this thing or I said that. And, and so I went to them and I apologized and I asked them to forgive me, damn it. Mm -hmm. You see, because the world likes to just ignore stuff and keep moving. But that's not how God works. And that's not how God's people work. And that is not how God's plan for His people works. We have an obligation to those whom we have hurt. We have an obligation to those whom we have offended. We have an obligation to those whom we have, in fact, wronged in the past. In Luke chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, Then said he to the multitude that came forth to be baptized of him, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth, therefore, fruits worthy of repentance. And bring and begin not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Oh, I want to tell you today, even before a believer goes into the waters to be baptized, he ought to have a heart and a mind to make some things right. He ought to have or she ought to have a heart and a mind to go back to some that they've wounded or bruised or hurt or wronged in the past and do what they can to make the matter right. Got a little news for you today, children. This is going to shock some people. Some of you moms and dads out there, I got news for you. You have an obligation to your children. When you know you've mistreated and abused your children, you have an obligation to go to them and make the matter right. Uh, Christian parents out there, well, I was going through something. I was experiencing this. I was just, they got every excuse. They've got every explanation under the sun for why they beat their kids. Why they verbally abused their kids. Why they said hateful, malicious, mean, 
spirited things that crushed their children's spirit. And those things can never be taken back. The effects of that conduct ride with that child for the rest of their lives. We've got Christian people who turn around and Christian parents and they say, well, I'm redeemed. Like Mr. Herschel down there in Georgia. I'm redeemed, therefore my kids just need to understand that God forgave me and therefore they need to forgive me. Um, yeah, they are obligated by God to forgive you, but let me tell you what's required before the obligation for them to forgive you. Let me tell you what you're obligated to do first. To seek their forgiveness. Read your Bible again. Jesus said, if your brother sinned against you, remember how they come to the Lord and they say, Lord, if your brother sinned against you, are you just supposed to forgive him? That's not what it says. It says, if your brother sinned against you and then he comes and repents, are you to forgive him? The Lord said, yes. He comes to you and repents. You are obligated to forgive him. Then they said, well, how many times in a day should we do this? And the Lord said, if your brother sinned against you 70 times, and 70 times, isn't this what it says? He comes and repents. You're to forgive him each and every time. You see, as a child of God, we have no option. We're not afforded the option of holding a grudge. We're not afforded the option of withholding forgiveness if it is requested of us. The minute somebody comes to you and genuinely apologizes or repents of any wrongdoing, as a child of God, we are obligated to forgive them. Again, I'm going to go to a passage that is often misunderstood. Jesus, in what is often described as the Lord's Prayer, He says in the Lord's Prayer, Forgive us our debt or forgive us our sin, even as we forgive those who trespass against us. That doesn't mean that you're forgiving them willy-nilly. That you're just sitting here saying, I forgive them, and therefore they're forgiven. No, no, no. But if somebody trespasses against you, and they come to you, and you forgive them as you're obligated by the Word of God to forgive them, then you're able to go to God and say, Lord, forgive me, even as I've been forgiving others who ask my Forgiveness. Why? Because God doesn't ask us to do what God doesn't do. That's not the Christianity I grew up in. That's not the church I grew up in. The church I grew up in told me that God expected people to do more than God Himself does. Really? What do you mean, Pastor? The Bible said, if we confess our sin... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But does He forgive sin that is not confessed? No. What is the prerequisite to forgiveness? Confession. Got news for you. The same stands true on planet Earth. The same stands true between you and I. The same stands true between people we've hurt in the past and people we hurt in the present and that we offend and that we wound. The same stands true for the, the transaction of forgiveness. It requires that it first be acknowledged. Once it is acknowledged, if you're a child of God hearing that confession, if you're a child of God hearing someone own that wrongdoing, then you're obligated by the Word of God to forgive. And if you hold on to that sin, if you hold on to that hurt, if you hold on to that 
wrongdoing and you don't want to forgive it even after someone has come and asked you to do so. The very person who visited it upon you, if you hold on to it, honey, you're on shaky ground when it comes to standing before God in the judgment. Because you cannot rightfully go to the Lord and say, Lord, forgive me, even as I am forgiving those who trespass against me. Do you follow what I'm trying to tell you? I've had people in my life do some pretty rotten things. I'm going to tell you, if, it, if you ever want people to do you dirty, if you ever want people to hurt you and really turn on you like a snake and and really do use all kind of negative, bad ways. Become a pastor. People that you've never done anything but love and care about. People that you've never done a single malicious thing in the universe to. People that you have only tried to help and be a blessing to and encourage and inspire and uplift. Those same people will turn on you like a snake. There's an old saying, anybody who has studied psychology knows. There's a simple saying in psychology that says, hurt people, hurt people. I'm going to tell you, when people come into the church and I hear their background and I hear their story and I know that they come from a place of a lot of pain and a lot of hurt, I know in advance they're going to, as sure as I'm alive, they're going to stab me in the back, they're going to twist the knife, they're going to turn it, they're going to make sure they visit as much pain on me as they can. And without fail, they do. You know why? Because hurt people hurt people. You know, a hurt dog, that dog can be as friendly and as sweet as pie under normal circumstances. But you let that dog get hurt enough and you don't want to try to go near it because it'll bite you. Because it's hurt and it's afraid. Well, the same thing is true of human beings. People who have gone through some very traumatic, difficult life experiences and they wind up deeply hurt and deeply wounded, they can hurt you too. And it happens all the time when you're a pastor. And then I've had these same people. I'll never, I'll never forget one, one couple. Really, it was one lady in particular, but I remember the couple. And they pulled a stunt, and it was very hurtful, and left the church, and were saying all kind of negative things about me, and talking bad about me in the community, and all this. I said, oh well, hurt people, hurt people. Then after several months, I got an email and she was all apologetic and asked me if I'd forgive her. And I said, well, of course I will, certainly. So they started coming back to church for a little while. And guess what? They turned around. She did the same exact thing all over again. But if she came to me tomorrow and said, would you forgive me? I'd say, yep, and I'd move on and we'd move on and and I'd be open to her hurting me all over again because I'm obligated by God to forgive. Amen. Do you understand what I'm talking about today? You see, our obligation to those whom we've wounded and those whom we've hurt does not end at the altar of repentance. Folks, no. No, as a child of God, we're supposed to live our lives a step above the world. We're supposed to live by a different standard than the world. The world thinks that it's best to just move on. It's best to just ignore it and move forward and act like it never happened. But that is not the best way to do things. And God knows that is not the best way to do things. And therefore, for the mental health and the spiritual well-being of both the injured party and the injurer, God Himself has established that His way of doing things is, if you can make it right in this life, do so. Because once you've settled that matter on earth, you will never again have to face it in heaven. It'll be a settled matter. And on Judgment Day, that is, shall never even come up because it's already been settled. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Oh, I want to tell you, 
there's a lot of things. I've done a lot of stupid things in my life. A lot of dumb things. And I probably made more wrong turns than I have right turns. But I'm going to tell you right now, every opportunity that I've had, every opportunity God gives me to make right by those that I've wronged, I'll take advantage of that opportunity. That way, when I stand before God, I will have at least, you know, kind of chipped away at the list that I'll have to face Him for. Amen? Mm. Praise God. Amen. It is not the job of preachers and believers to convince an unsaved world that they are to accept the determinations of heaven. It's, an, it's insane to try and force people of the world to accept spiritual principles and spiritual ideals which they do not embrace. And I got news for you. Our God does not ask us to do so. The Lord does not ask us to force people to accept the fact that He's forgiven us. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? That is not a scriptural concept. In 1 Samuel 16 and 7, but the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as men seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. I'm going to tell you, if I had a nickel for every time somebody tried to excuse past bad conduct with... Well, God looks on the heart. Man looks on the outward appearance. God looks on the heart. Here's the problem with that, honey. Here's the problem with using that as an escape for all bad conduct and all bad behavior. That passage says two very important things. One thing is God looks on the heart. That's very important. It's good to know. I'm glad God looks on my heart and He doesn't look on my outward activity and my outward expression and my outward conduct. I'm glad for that. However, that passage also says man looks on the outward appearance. So what does that tell you? That tells you no matter what's going on in your heart, nobody can see that. Right. So therefore, if they're going to be able to see what's in your heart, you're going to have to somehow find a way to demonstrate that outwardly. You're going to have to find some way to demonstrate that through actions. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? It's a very simple principle. You see, but they love to quote that scripture. Oh, they love to jump on it. God looks on my heart. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Yeah, but man doesn't see your heart, honey. So when you've hurt somebody and you've done somebody wrong and you mistreated somebody and you abused somebody and you wronged somebody, then they can't see what's in your heart. So you better do something that helps them to see that you're sorry. That's what it means when we read how that uh, uh, the Lord called men to bring forth meat under repentance and John the Baptist called men to bring forth uh, meat unto repentance. That's what it means when Paul said that you know he was teaching repentance and that people had to make things right as an expression of what God was doing on the inside. So these politicians who want to run around saying, I'm redeemed, hallelujah, glory to God. So you just need to forget all about everybody I screwed over. Forget about everybody I did dirty. Forget about all the women I impregnated. Forget about all the children I forgot exist in the world, and yet I'm their daddy. That is not scriptural. God's, excuse me, for centuries, figures within the organized crime community have used the Roman Catholic dogma of absolution as a means whereby they might repeatedly commit horrendous acts of crime and debauchery. 
You can go out and murder and you go into the church and you confess to the priest. The priest can't tell the law nothing. They can't tell anybody nothing. You go in there and tell, oh, I chopped her head off and fed it to the dogs. And then, and the priest, okay, say five Hail Marys and six Yahoos and Yippee-I-Yays. And you're forgiven. All's forgiven. Then the guy goes out and does the same thing next week that he did last week. Am I telling the truth? Well, I'll tell you, there's a lot of Christians pull the same garbage the only difference is a lot of fundamentalists, a lot of evangelicals, the only difference is they don't believe they have to go to the priest. They believe as long as I talk to Jesus about it, it's forgiven and forgotten forever and I don't need to be bothered with it anymore. Wrong. You have an obligation to those whom you have wronged. God's forgiveness is not a free pass. To walk away from our past, to no longer have any responsibility to the victims or those who have been affected by our wrongdoing. To even suggest such a thing is a gross perversion of biblical teaching. In Luke 19, 8 and 9, And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Look, behold, Lord! The half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to the house, to this house, for as much as he also is a son of Abraham. Zacchaeus did not come by this figure of repaying fourfold out of the blue, folks. The law of Moses had provisions within it which required under certain circumstances that those who had been wronged had to have restitution made fourfold. So Zacchaeus, this wasn't just the numbers Zacchaeus pulled out of his head. No. There were provisions in the law. If you stole certain property from a man, then when you were when you were going to make right, if if you were going to make that issue right, you had to give back to him fourfold. If you stole a man's donkey, you couldn't make it right by simply giving him back a donkey. No. You stole his donkey. For as long as he was without that animal, he couldn't do the things he normally would do with that animal. And I tell the truth. So therefore, what do you have to do? You had to pay him back fourfold. You had to give him four donkeys in return in order to, according to the law of Moses. Do you follow what I'm telling you? What am I trying to tell you? I'm trying to tell you even in the law of Moses, even in the law of Moses, there were provisions for restitution. There was never, ever, ever a law written by God which simply said, once you offer this sacrifice or once you offer that sacrifice, the matter is forgotten. And the person who was robbed, the person who was stolen from, the person who was done dirty just has to forget about it. No. Within the law, you never read one single issue that is addressed in that fashion. No. Every single time, if you were going to make the matter right, you had to make this offering or you had to go through this ritual or this purification ritual and uh, you had to make restitution. In some instances, if you restored to the person what they had lost, then the matter was settled. In other instances, it actually required that you restore to them many more times than what you had taken. Pastor, what are you trying to say today? I'm trying to say today, folks, we have an obligation to do right by those we've wronged. Exodus chapter 22, the last passage I'm going to read today. Exodus 22, 1 through 7, If a man shall steal an ox or a sheep and kill it or sell it, he, will, he shall restore five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. If a thief be found breaking up and be smitten that he die, there shall no blood be shed for him. 
If the Son be risen upon him, there shall be blood shed for him, for he should make full restitution. If he have nothing, then he shall be sold for his theft. Boy, talk about making restitution. If he doesn't have the resources to make restitution, then you know what? Then he sold into bondage. He sold into slavery so that his debt can be paid. That's how seriously God takes restitution. That's how seriously God takes doing right by those we've wronged. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? He continues and says, If the theft be certainly found in his hand alive, whether it be ox or ass or sheep, he shall restore double. In other words, if you catch the man stealing the ox or the sheep or whatever, then he has to restore to you double. Still, if you catch him, if you don't catch him and he gets away with it and he sells the ox or he sells the sheep, then you've got to restore to him fourfold or fivefold. If a man shall cause a field or vineyard to be eaten, and shall put in his beast, and shall feed in another man's field, of the best of his own field, and of the best of his own vineyard, shall he make restitution. So if you put your ox in somebody else's property to feed on his grass, or to feed on his grain, or whatever the case might be, the Lord said, you're going to have to give up some of the best property you own in order to make restitution. This was all codified within the law of Moses. This is how seriously God takes restitution. If fire break out and catch in thorns, so that the stacks of corn or the standing corn or the field be consumed where therewith, he that kindled the fire shall surely make restitution. If a man shall deliver unto his neighbor money or stuff to keep, and it be stolen out of the man's house, if the thief be found, let him pay double. That's all within the law of Moses. While God may forgive us our sins and our wrongdoings, this does not mean we no longer bear any responsibility for those wrongdoings here in this world. A righteous man knows that he is obligated to seek forgiveness from those he has wronged and to restore or make restitution for any losses he may have caused. It is folly to preach at the unsaved expecting them to accept the terms of spiritual transactions. If we are to live the lives God has called us to live and represent the gospel in a manner which brings honor and not shame upon the faith, then we must learn today to do right by those that we have wronged.